I'd like to welcome you to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast for the June 13th, 2022 issue. This is Season 2, Episode Number 4. Evidence-Based Hair is a podcast produced by the Donovan Hair Academy and addresses new research in the field of hair loss. We'll use our time together not only to talk about what's new in the field of hair loss, but to reflect on how all this new information ties in with what we've come to learn in the past and we'll think carefully about where we're heading as a hair loss community. I'll use various studies each week as a pivot point to discuss key diagnostic pearls and treatment tips that hopefully allow us all to become better practitioners. This podcast was created for practitioners of various backgrounds, but regardless of whether you care for patients with hair loss or simply care about the topic of hair loss, this podcast will be of interest. This podcast was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The second Monday of each month is dedicated to the four T's, telogen effluvium, traction alopecia, trichotillomania, and tinea capitis. And today I'll review eight studies from the past month or two in these particular areas. We'll begin by talking about telogen effluvium and a mechanism of telogen effluvium that has been wondered for some time but it now seems to be a bona fide mechanism, and that is dystrophic antigen effluvium. It's well recognized that COVID-19 infection can cause hair shedding. It often happens two to three months after the COVID infection, but there's a group of patients that have early onset shedding. And for the last long time, it's been debated about what exactly is this? Why do some patients shed in a matter of two, three or four weeks? Well, new data is accumulating that suggests this may be a dystrophic antigen effluvium. Antigen effluvium is familiar to us from the hair loss that happens with chemotherapy. And here we have a mechanism of antigen effluvium happening in COVID-19 infection. Then we'll go on to talk about iron and the use of iron every other day as opposed to every day in patients with iron deficiency anemia. Data over the last four or five years is teaching us that giving iron every other day is probably just as good, if not better, than giving it every day. And we'll take a look at that data. Then we'll look at a large study looking at the safety of IV or intravenous iron. 25 years ago, intravenous iron was a somewhat scary subject because of the high incidence of side effects. New iron formulations over the last few decades have increased the safety of intravenous iron infusions. We'll take a look at a large study which looks at the safety of iron infusions. How common are iron infusion reactions? How common is anaphylaxis? Then we'll look at telogen effluvium and hair loss from SSRIs or the antidepressant serotonin receptor inhibitor type drugs. And we'll look at how hair loss from SSRIs compares to other antidepressants like uh, bupropion. Then we'll talk about traction alopecia and a very interesting study looking at the use of oral minoxidil in traction alopecia. And finally, we'll conclude with the use of N-acetylcysteine in trichotillomania. The most effective treatments for trichotillomania in adults appear to be habit reversal therapy and various behavioral therapies, but a number of pharmacologic therapies like olanzapine, like N-acetylcysteine, like clomipramine may be helpful in trichotillomania. The benefit of N-acetylcysteine is it's pretty safe. It's over the counter. It's in your pharmacy shelves or your drugstore shelves or in the natural food store or on the internet. It's widely available. How good is it in trichotillomania? How good is it in adults? How good is it in children? We'll take a look at this data and we'll take a look at an interesting study showing benefit in a 17-year-old male with trichotillomania. The references for all of these studies that I'll present today are in the show notes that accompany this episode. So let's begin by talking about telogen effluvium and let's begin by talking about a new mechanism of hair shedding after COVID-19 infection.
An interesting study from March by Shanshal looked at the potential for COVID-19 to induce an antigen effluvium. And an antigen effluvium is a type of hair loss that occurs with the release of funny looking antigen hairs from the scalp or what we call dystrophic antigen hairs. It can look very similar to a telogen effluvium because the patient has hair loss and they have hair coming out and it's very distressing, but the mechanism is different. And so a study in the Journal of Dermatologic Treatment suggested that antigen effluvium may actually be a mechanism of COVID-19. And a study very recently by Miola and colleagues from Brazil suggested that indeed dystrophic antigen effluvium may be a mechanism by which hairs are shedding from the scalp in patients with COVID-19. So we'll take a look at these studies. Hair loss after COVID-19 is a really relevant topic because it's pretty common. And estimates suggest that 20 to 50% of patients will get hair shedding after COVID-19, especially with the early variants. The data is not clear with Omicron yet, and it may in fact be slightly less. But the key point is that hair shedding is pretty common in patients that get COVID-19. And what is becoming clear is not everyone has the same story. In the early days of COVID-19, one of the first studies came out that suggested that patients with COVID-19 who are going to get shedding, get shedding about 56 days after infection. A second study came out and said, after COVID-19, patients that are going to get shedding, get shedding 57 days after COVID-19. So pretty consistent data. And then data started to emerge suggesting that mm, sometimes it's a bit later, sometimes it's a bit earlier. And some data suggested that some patients have shedding within weeks rather than two months or three months. And so the classic telogen effluvium, the classic hair shedding after viruses, after triggers, after stress, after weight loss, happens about two to three months after that trigger arrives on the scene. With COVID-19, it appears that that kind of mechanism is present, but another mechanism is also present, and that's this early onset shedding. So... Shanshal published a nice report in March in the Journal of Dermatologic Treatment of an antigen effluvium in a patient with COVID-19. And I don't think this received a lot of attention because the literature has been so permeated by reports of telogen effluvium that this report almost leads one to feel that Mm, the authors interpret it as an antigen effluvium. I think they meant telogen effluvium. But it certainly was there sitting in the literature for us all to reflect upon. And I congratulate the author for you know getting this report out in the literature. The patient in the report was a 35-year-old woman who was admitted with COVID-19 in the early days of the pandemic. She was quite sick. And 10 days after admission, she had a rash and a type of hair loss, which the author uh, diagnosed as an antigen effluvium. So instead of telogen hairs coming out of the scalp, the author proposed that these were antigen hairs. Now, in this report, in the March issue of the Journal of Dermatologic Treatment, the author doesn't show the hairs, doesn't describe the hairs in detail. The author just says this was an antigen effluvium. Miola and colleagues published a nice report in JAD recently characterizing the type of hairs that were lost in greater detail. And I really like this study and it really provides us with some pretty convincing data that some patients with COVID-19 probably have a telogen effluvium, but some patients probably have a dystrophic antigen effluvium. So we have a brand new mechanism. So these authors from Brazil set out to evaluate the clinical presentation of 203 hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Of these 203 patients, 5% had hair loss 
with early onset during the hospitalization. So not at two months, not at three months, not with what we would expect, but hair loss within 30 days of COVID-19 infection. And so seven of these patients were assessed with trichoscopy, a trichogram, and a biopsy to try to figure out in further detail, what are the hairs that are coming out? And all of these patients had a positive pull test. And so a positive pull test means that you reach for hairs gently on the scalp and they come out. We're pretty programmed as hair specialists to think if we have hairs coming out, that's a telogen effluvium. But, you know, hairs can come out from telogen effluvium. Hairs can come out from antigen effluvium. Hairs can come out from loose antigen syndrome. Um, and so a positive pull test doesn't just mean telogen effluvium. The trichoscopy of these seven patients showed empty follicles didn't show broken hairs, which we typically see in a, a more classic antigen effluvium from chemotherapy. It didn't show yellow dots, which is more typical of a telogen effluvium, didn't show an anisotrichosis, which is a variation in caliber of hairs seen in androgenetic hair loss. The trichogram, or forcefully plucking hairs from the scalp, showed that there was more than 10% dystrophic antigen hairs, or antigen hairs that are somewhat abnormal looking. And more than 20% of the hairs were telogen hairs. A biopsy was done in these seven patients. And so we have trichoscopy data, we have trichogram data, we have biopsy data. There was a predominance of antigen hairs in that biopsy, no miniaturization. There was some increase in the proportion of telogen hairs, but none more than 25% telogen hairs. And there was no inflammation. So all in all, the authors propose this is a dystrophic antigen effluvium in these patients with early onset hair shedding after COVID-19. And so I really like this study and I really like the prior study, which gives us new data that hair shedding after COVID-19 is probably a bit more complex than we had first thought. When the pandemic first came, we compared the COVID-19 virus to the type of hair shedding that came with, with the influenza pandemic of 1918, with dengue virus, with other viruses. And that's a classic telogen effluvium happening two to three months after infection. And now we have this new data that COVID-19 is much more complex than we imagined, which as I'm sure you're well aware, is proving itself to be the case in many parts of medicine. So we have telogen effluvium as one mechanism. We have dystrophic antigen effluvium as the other mechanism. And so from telogen effluvium and antigen effluvium, we move to two studies on the use of iron supplementation. It's really important for hair specialists to know about iron supplementation because so many patients present with low iron and low iron is relevant for many cases of hair loss not everyone some patients have low iron and it's not causing hair loss so we have to be careful in saying that everyone with low iron has uh, hair loss from their low iron but it's critical for us to know about how to prescribe iron what are the side effects of iron what do we do when patients don't improve their iron? What workups do we need to do for iron deficiency? If patients have iron deficiency, we have to be thinking about, is it because they're not absorbing it properly? Is it because they're not getting enough in their diet? Is it because they're losing too much with heavy periods in women or from potential cancers that are causing bleeding? So we have to have a good understanding of iron as hair specialists. The study I'd like to present looks at a comparison of giving iron every day versus giving iron every other day. There's been a lot of data accumulating over the last few years suggesting that giving iron every other day is probably just as good compared to giving it every day. And we'll take a look at this data. So iron deficiency is super common. It's the most common cause of anemia in the world. 
And the WHO estimated in 2019 that about 30% of non-pregnant women in the world have iron deficiency anemia. And iron deficiency anemia accounts for about half of all cases of anemia in women. So it's clearly a really relevant subject. So when you have patients with iron deficiency anemia, and you've thought about other causes, and you think that the appropriate step is to prescribe iron, how should you give iron? Well, the current recommendations are to give iron every day and perhaps divide it twice daily or three times daily, depending on the patient, their tolerance and their, their ferritin levels. The goal is to bring the ferritin and the hemoglobin back up to normal levels. But iron isn't an easy tablet or pill or capsule to take. The use of iron supplementation can cause constipation. In some patients, it causes diarrhea. It can cause nausea, heartburn, metallic taste in the mouth. So it's not a particularly easy pill to take for some patients. For some patients, it's just fine. For some patients, it has these side effects. And so some patients start iron, they develop side effects, and then they reduce their intake of iron because they don't like this pill. And so what are some ways which we can reduce the side effects of iron so the patients can feel comfortable taking it? Well, one is to move from taking it every day to taking it every other day. And the concern about taking it every other day is, is it going to be less effective? Well, there's a lot of data accumulating over the last few years that taking it every other day is probably a great idea and it's probably even better than taking it every day. Taking it every other day may reduce side effects, but taking it every other day may reduce the ability of the body to produce a protein called hepcidin. And when you take iron pills, the body makes hepcidin. And that's kind of the body's way to block further iron absorption so we don't overload ourselves. If we take iron every other day, the body doesn't have a chance to make as much hepcidin, and that may facilitate the ongoing accumulation and absorption of iron. And so authors are interested in studying the use of iron every other day and whether, in fact, this is a great way to prescribe iron and whether hepcidin levels are lower if we give it every other day. Well, a really important study was published in 2017 by Stoffel and colleagues, and I'd like to review this before we get into this new study. This was a study in Lancet Hematology in 2017. And the author showed us that taking iron every other day is probably just as effective, maybe even more effective than taking it daily. And so in this study by Stoffel, 2017, women were randomized to two groups. One was given 60 milligrams of ferrous sulfate in the morning for 14 days in a row. And the other group was given 60 milligrams of ferrous sulfate every other day for twice as long. So there was 40 women in the study, 21 received daily iron, 19 received iron every other day. And at the end of the study, patients receiving iron every day accumulated 131 milligrams of iron. Patients receiving iron every other day accumulated, accumulated 175 milligrams of iron in the body. So more iron absorption occurred with every other day dosing and serum hepcidin levels were greater in the group that received iron every day. And so the body had a greater ability to make hepcidin when it was presented with iron every day. And there were other studies over the last few years which have shown a similar finding, and that is that every other day dosing is probably better. Meta published a study in 2020 with similar data. And in Meta's study, there was 40 patients, 20 patients in a group receiving iron every day, and 20 patients in a group receiving iron every other day. And the authors showed that alternate day dosing of iron, 60 milligrams of ferrous sulfate, 
60 milligrams of elemental iron as ferrous sulfate was more effective and better tolerated compared to daily supplementation in patients with iron deficiency anemia. And the authors also showed that hepcidin levels increased more when iron was given every day. So now we come to this study by Kaner and colleagues in the Annals of Hematology in April. And so the authors set out to compare the effectiveness of daily versus every other day iron in women 18 to 50 with iron deficiency anemia. The authors included premenopausal women with iron deficiency anemia, hemoglobin less than 12, ferritin less than 30, and or a transferrin saturation less than 15%. One group had iron sulfate, 160 milligrams every day, 40 patients in that group. The other group had iron sulfate, 160 milligrams every other day, 43 patients in that group. The age of the patients in both groups was pretty similar, about 35.6, 35.8 years, and this wasn't statistically different. Hemoglobin at baseline was about 10, and after two months of treatment, rose to about 13.2 or 13.3. And so the increases in hemoglobin were statistically similar in both these groups, regardless of whether they got it every day or got iron every other day. The ferritin levels rose from 4 to 23 in both groups, and it didn't matter whether this was iron daily or every other day. And so overall, there was no differences between these two protocols, suggesting that they're both similar protocols. So we can give iron every day, we can give it every other day, and expect similar results. Hepcidin levels rose in both groups, and they were not statistically different in both groups. And so giving iron every other day is easier on the patient, compliance is likely better, and we can be assured that in the vast majority of women that the effect should be the same as if we give it daily in women with iron deficiency anemia. And so these are really interesting data that's accumulating over these last few years that giving iron every day might not be the protocol that we need to adhere to, which has been in the gastroenterology literature for quite some time. And we need to consider that giving it every other day may be a very valid way to use it. So from iron dosing every other day, we move to intravenous iron. There are some patients that really don't absorb iron very well. And despite iron supplementation, their ferritin doesn't increase. We're worried about these patients for various reasons. Perhaps they have gastro, gastro um, intestinal disease. Perhaps they have other reasons why they can't take iron. Is iron infusions a way to go? Well, occasionally I do refer patients for iron infusions. Patients that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, remember the days when iron infusions were kind of a scary topic because of the side effects that occurred years ago. But the new iron formulations are much safer. And today I'd like to review with you a very large study looking at the safety of intravenous iron infusions. And so IV iron or intravenous iron, it's more effective and it's a faster way to increase ferritin levels. Now it's not a method for everyone. For many people, oral iron is the way to go. But there is a concern among some clinicians about performing iron injections. And this concern comes from the years gone by where some of the older formulations especially high molecular weight iron dextran, carried a high risk of side effects. And that was first made available about 25 years ago. And now we have several new formulations. And so this new study set out to determine how common infusion reactions are. And are there any serious side effects like anaphylaxis? Side effects that require administration of epinephrine. So this was a multi-center cohort study 
Iron infusions were given to 12,237 patients. Some of these patients had more than one visit for an infusion, and so in total there was 35,000 infusions. Almost 80% of the patients in the study were female, the mean age was 51, 84% of patients were white, 6% were black. What type of infusions were given? Well, there was 22,000 iron sucrose doses, almost 10,000 iron dextran doses, including the more common low molecular weight iron dextran, uh, about 3,000 ferumoxetol doses, and about 12,000 ferric carboxymaltose doses. So these are the four types of iron infusions used in this study. How common were infusion reactions? Well, it differed according to the type of iron, but about 4% of infusions had some type of infusion reaction. Iron sucrose and iron dextran were more likely to give infusion reactions. About 4% of patients receiving those types of iron had reactions. Ferrumoxetol had 2% of infusion reactions and 1.4% with ferric carboxymaltose. And of these 35,000 infusions, there was only two serious reactions that required epinephrine, and those were with iron dextran. So that's about 1 in 17,000 risk. So pretty interesting data and pretty reassuring data that serious side effects are quite rare. What I particularly found interesting in this study is that patients that received pre-medications, especially Benadryl and antihistamines, were more likely to have infusion reactions. In fact, they were 23-fold more likely to have infusion reactions. And the authors point out that some of these antihistamines like diphenhydramine, Benadryl, as well as even the second generation antihistamines, can in and of themselves cause flushing, hypotension, tachycardia, um, uh, of sleepiness, palpitations, dizziness, and so they can be easily confused with infusion reactions. But overall, the key point of this study is in 35,000 infusions with iron, that serious side effects are rare, and only two of 35,000 patients, 35,000 infusion reactions needed epinephrine. Infusion reactions, so rashes and mild side effects, do occur in about 4% of patients, but these are generally not serious. So this is reassuring in patients that really need iron, that they can be reassured that there's good safety with these iron infusions. So we turn finally in the category of telogen effluvium to look at hair shedding from SSRIs, or the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And about 1 in 10 patients, 1 in 10 individuals in the U.S. are on antidepressants. The age group with the highest use in one study was women 40 to 50, where about one in four women were using antidepressants. Data is similar in many other countries, including the UK, uh, and the use of antidepressants is on the rise. So it's really important for us to know about antidepressants. It's really important for us to be aware of the data on the relationship between antidepressant use and hair shedding. Many patients are terrified to use an antidepressant because of the worry about hair shedding. And the reality is, is that about 1 in 100 patients or less who use an antidepressant can expect to get some hair shedding. And the key message here that I'd like to present to you is we don't have any good data to suggest that any of the SSRIs are truly any different. There's a hint that, well, maybe paroxetine might have the lowest risk of shedding, but it's not good data and it's not statistically significant. So the data really suggests that all of the antidepressants of the SSRI family are pretty similar. One in a hundred or less chance of shedding. So 99% of patients are expected to have no hair shedding. As we'll see in a minute, hair loss from bupropion is higher than the SSRIs. 
So the SSRIs include this group of medications, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, sertraline, paroxetine, citalopram, escitalopram. And they're approved for an array of conditions, depression being a more common use, but anxiety, OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, depending on the antidepressant. The first SSRI was fluoxetine, that's Prozac. And that was approved in 1987, came to market in 1988. We don't really know how common hair loss is from SSRIs. We estimate about one in a hundred or less. And many publications, the LITS Drug Eruption Manual, puts it at around one in a hundred or, or one in a hundred or less, depending on the SSRI. We don't really have fantastic data but we do have data that tells us that, yeah, they can cause hair loss. So let's take a look at some prior studies which have tried to look into this data in terms of the risk of hair shedding from SSRIs. So very nice study in 2018 by Etteman and colleagues is important for us to know about. It was a retrospective cohort study using a really large database, including over a million new users of various antidepressants, including the SSRIs, including the SNRIs, including bupropion. The most common antidepressant in that study by Etteman and colleagues in 2018 was sertraline. Fluvoxamine, Luvox, was one of the least prescribed in that database. So here's the key message of that 2018 study, and that is that bupropion has a higher risk of hair loss than the SSRIs. It has a higher risk than fluoxetine, higher risk than paroxetine, and a higher risk than fluvoxamine. And in that study, the suggestion was that maybe the SSRIs might differ in and of themselves. Maybe paroxetine has the lowest risk. Maybe fluoxetine has pretty low risk. Maybe fluvoxamine has higher risk, but it wasn't statistically significant. So all that we can really say in that study is that bupropion has a slightly higher risk of hair shedding than the SSRIs. And when you compare fluvo fluoxetine to the other antidepressants, the only thing that comes out clear is that bupropion is carrying a higher risk of shedding. And paroxetine looks like it has a lower risk of shedding than fluoxetine, but the data isn't statistically significant. So we really can't conclude that. And so overall, the key message here in this 2018 study is that bupropion has a slightly higher risk of shedding. It's not a huge increased risk, but it's a slight increased risk. It appears that the SSRIs are pretty similar in their risk. So a new study by Pechich and Powdow in psychiatry, uh, psychiatry research from May looked at this data a little bit further. And it's a nice study because it reminds us about the importance of this information. And so the authors had some pretty strict criteria looking at data and research in the past about hair loss with SSRIs. They found uh, a number of studies in the medical literature looking at hair loss from SSRIs. Patients in the literature range from 7 to 85. Most were female. And when you look in the literature, the most common SSRI reported to cause hair loss is by far fluoxetine, followed by data on sertraline, citalopram, escitalopram, fluvoxamine, and paroxetine. But that's just based on the number of studies. That's not based on any good data suggesting that in controlled trials that this has a higher risk than that. This is just based on the number of studies. And so fluoxetine leads the way in that regard. When you look in the literature, it is interesting that most of the studies, of course, show that hair loss affects the scalp, but there is data that some patients with SSRIs have hair loss on the eyelashes, the eyebrows, the underarm hair, the legs, the pubic hair, and body hair, and chest hair. So it can occur in many areas, but that's not common. It mostly affects the scalp. And when you look in the literature, you can really appreciate that the data is kind of all over the place. 
Some patients report hair loss within three days. Some patients report hair loss within five years of use. As time goes on, it becomes less and less likely that a drug is related to the hair loss. And in many patients, when you stop the SSRI, hair loss improved and there was a recovery of hair loss. And so that's important for our patients uh, that that can occur. So this particular paper was not designed to confirm rigorous statistical data. It was more of a descriptive study, but it, it has some interesting points for us, and that is that fluoxetine certainly is the most commonly described SSRI to cause hair loss, and the number of studies with fluoxetine vastly outnumbers any of the other SSRIs. But the paper wasn't designed to give a number to say that fluoxetine is 1.2 times more likely, or 1.8 times, or 4.5 times. That's not what this paper was about. But nevertheless, when you, when you look at all the SSRI data, we can reassure patients that risk of hair loss is probably 1 in 100 or less. Maybe a slightly greater risk with some antidepressants like bupropion compared to the SSRIs. We're not really sure if any of the SSRIs differ from each other. Maybe, just maybe, paroxetine has some pretty good um, risk profile, but it's not solid data, and much of the data would suggest that the risk of shedding from paroxetine is probably the same as the other SSRIs. But we need more studies and ongoing accumulation of data, but uh, that's where we're at so far. So from telogen effluvium, we move to traction alopecia and the use of oral minoxidil in traction alopecia. Are you using oral minoxidil for hair loss? Are you using oral minoxidil for traction alopecia? Well, certainly oral minoxidil is increasingly used around the world for various hair loss conditions, including androgenetic hair loss, and we've talked about that several times in prior episodes of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. We've talked about oral minoxidil in children. We've talked about oral minoxidil in adults. We've talked about oral minoxidil when it's overdosed by mistake. So we focused a lot on the use of oral minoxidil because it's important for us as clinicians to develop some solid skills in prescribing oral minoxidil. You can use oral minoxidil in androgenetic hair loss, alopecia areata, traction alopecia, which we'll see today chronic telogen effluvium, post-chemotherapy alopecia, scarring alopecia, and even loose antigen hair syndrome. So lots of uses of oral minoxidil. None of these are FDA approved. It's all off-label. And typically we use low-dose oral minoxidil, which means anywhere from 0.25 milligrams up to 5 milligrams. And so when we approach the oral minoxidil literature for traction alopecia, it's important to understand some studies that have come in the past. And Dr. Beach published a very nice study in dermatologic therapy in 2018 looking at four patients with traction alopecia who received oral minoxidil. These were young patients, 25 to 32 years of age, who used oral minoxidil, 1.25 milligrams at night. And it was really well tolerated. None of these patients had feelings of low blood pressure, none of these patients had fluid retention, none of these patients had hair shedding after starting. One patient of the four had increased hair on the face, and compliance was pretty good. Three of these four patients continued the oral minoxidil at 1.25 milligrams. One patient stopped the oral minoxidil because of fear of this medication. And now we have a very nice study in JAD case reports from April by Kim and Craig Lowe looking at another wonderful case report of the use of oral minoxidil for traction alopecia. And I really like this study. It's available free. JAD case reports are available free online with Creative Commons license. And so you can access it yourself. Available through Google, available through PubMed. These references are in the show notes. So this was a 31-year-old female with traction alopecia who had a history of tight hairstyles in the past, but was no longer wearing those tight hairstyles. She was using chemical relaxers. She had used topical minoxidil in the past to try to treat the traction alopecia without any success. 
She had also used topical corticosteroids. And so she was prescribed oral minoxidil, 1.25 milligrams daily. She was also prescribed a topical corticosteroid solution two to three times a week for the first two months, fluosinonide. After six months of using oral minoxidil, there was some improvement and her dose was increased from 1.25 milligrams daily to 1.25 milligrams twice daily. So 2.5 milligrams total dose. After five more months, there was even more regrowth of hair on the scalp, and the patient continued her use of chemical relaxers during this time. And so when you look online at this publication, which I would encourage you to do, you can see this very nice improvement in the temples with the use of oral minoxidil at 1.25 milligrams twice a day. And so these are results that we can expect in early traction alopecia. Certainly we want to encourage patients to reduce the traction force as if possible, if there's any pulling on the hair. If we can be as gentle on the hair as possible, it's, it is part of the plan. We want to check iron levels. We want to check vitamin D levels. We want to rule out other conditions that may be present, including scarring alopecia, including CCCA. I'm a big fan of using corticosteroid injections in early traction alopecia combined with um, oral minoxidil or topical minoxidil or both. But this is a really nice study which points out the benefits of oral minoxidil in traction alopecia. With 2.5 milligrams daily dosing, we expect a large proportion of women to have hair growth on the face. It's usually mild, but it's to be expected. And this patient had some mild hypertrichosis on the cheeks, which didn't limit her ongoing use of oral minoxidil. So many women do have hair growth on the face with high doses of oral minoxidil, which for women is anything over 1.25 milligrams once a day. But it often does not limit the ongoing use. Women are very pleased with the results and choose to either continue or remove the hair by various means, but to continue the ongoing use of oral minoxidil. So there's three key points in this study, in my view, and the reason I want to present it today is that oral minoxidil certainly is an option for traction alopecia, and it's an option for patients that don't get results with topical minoxidil. Oral minoxidil is probably best started at 1.25 milligrams or 0.625 milligrams, or if you're more comfortable, 0.25 milligrams, and move up from there. I've, I generally start at 0.625 or 1.25 milligrams. I rarely ever start above 1.25 milligrams. Many colleagues do, many clinicians do. The thing I'd like you to be aware of is that not all women tolerate doses above 1.25 milligrams. Many women do. And in many previous episodes, we get many emails and comments from clinicians and patients saying, you know, I have many patients on 2.5 milligrams that do just fine. Absolutely. There's lots of patients that do great on 2.5 milligrams, but there's lots of patients that get fluid retention on 1.875. There's lots of patients that get uh, fluid retention on 2.5, lots of patients that get hair growth on the face as you go higher doses and it's dose dependent. So hypertrichosis is certainly a common side effect of oral minoxidil that we need to be aware of. And it doesn't necessarily prompt the stopping of oral minoxidil. And so that's a really important point here. So from oral minoxidil, we move to trichotillomania and the use of N-acetylcysteine. A really nice study by Popova and Mancuso in Global Pediatric Health from March 2022, looking at a pediatric patient, 17 years of age, but a pediatric patient responding very nicely to N-acetylcysteine. The reason I like this study is a lot of the pediatric data tells us that N-acetylcysteine works for adults, but doesn't seem to work well for children. And so here we have a 17-year-old 
which is almost an adult, and a very nice result with N acetylcysteine. So I'd like to look at the literature on N acetylcysteine and trichotillomania and come back to this study. So trichotillomania is a hair pulling disorder. It used to be classified as an impulse control disorder. Now it's classified as an obsessive compulsive disorder in the DSM-5 or the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual 5. And so there's a definition of trichotillomania which you should be aware of and that's recurrent pulling of hair, repeated attempts to stop, and the pulling causes distress in social or occupational or other parts of the person's life and it's not due to another medical condition. What's been removed from the DSM-5 is this tension that occurs before pulling and then this sense of relief or gratification after pulling. That used to be in the DSM-4. It's no longer in the DSM-5. So what are the treatments for trichotillomania? Well, some of the most effective treatments based on all of the literature are habit reversal therapy and various behavioral therapies, followed by pharmacologic therapy, olanzapine, N-acetylcysteine and clomipramine have some of the best evidence and probably in that order. We think of trichotillomania as uh, in the family of obsessive compulsive disorders and we think of it as it should be responsive to SSRIs. We'd like it to be responsive to SSRIs because we're really looking for options that can help but the reality is that the data suggests that SSRIs are really not that effective and probably uh, olanzapine, N-acetylcysteine, and clomipramine are more effective as pharmacotherapy. But habit reversal therapy and behavioral therapy is probably the most effective therapy. So we have to keep that in mind. N-acetylcysteine is this supplement, which is used 1,200 milligrams once daily or twice daily, or 600 milligrams twice daily, moving up to 1,200 milligrams twice daily. It takes about nine weeks to start working and a very nice study by Grant and colleagues in the archives of general psychiatry in 2009 showed that 56% of individuals benefit with N-acetylcysteine use compared to 16% using placebo. It really is important in these studies to take a look at the placebo responses. It's very, very relevant in much of dermatology and much of hair loss medicine, but especially in trichotillomania, placebo responses are very high. And acetylcysteine is pretty safe, causes nausea, bloating, gas, but most patients do really well on it. So does N acetylcysteine help children? Well, it's a good strategy for adults because of its safety. When we have patients with trichotillomania, we really do want to review the psychologic stressors. We do want to review underlying comorbidities, anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, post traumatic stress disorder, you know, rule out other conditions, get our colleagues on board psychiatrists, psychologists, the family doctor. But sometimes there is a resistance of patients to see healthcare pr practitioners in, in the mental health realm. But I think we shouldn't be of the opinion that if a patient has trichotillomania, we're going to give N-acetylcysteine and send them home. We really do want to really investigate these comorbidities. But N-acetylcysteine is popular because of its safety. But the data in children suggests that N-acetylcysteine is not really that helpful. And Block and colleagues published a nice study in 2013 which was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of N-acetylcysteine in children. And so it's important to know about this study, just like it's important to know about the Grant and colleagues' study in adults. So this was a study from Yale, which set out to examine the benefit of N-acetylcysteine in children. There was 39 children and adolescents. They ranged in age from 8 to 17. They had trichotillomania and they were randomized to N-acetylcysteine or placebo for 12 weeks. The primary outcome in this study was a change in severity of the hair pulling as measured by the MGH hair pulling scale. And there was a variety of secondary measures like repetitive pulling, clinician rated improvements, 
how anxiety and depression changed. There's no change in these measures with N-acetylcysteine compared to placebo in any of the primary or the secondary outcome measures. And many of the impatients in this study, many of the 39 patients improved over time. How many patients improved with N-acetylcysteine? 25%. And so you might say to yourself, well, that's great. A quarter of patients improve. Well, 21% of placebo patients improved. And so again, really important to be aware of this study and really important to be aware of the improvements that can occur in trichotillomania literature with placebo. It's really important to be aware of placebo rates in, in many hair loss studies. Most patients in androgenetic hair loss studies in the placebo group don't improve, but do pay attention to alopecia areata studies. Placebo rates are significant. 4%, 5%, 6% of patients with drugs to treat alopecia areata can improve with placebo. And so, you know, do pay attention to placebo rates. They'll, they'll fascinate you. The power of the mind, the power of placebo, it's huge. But it's really huge in trichotillomania studies. So keep that in mind as you review trichotillomania for the next decades. Popova and Mancuso had a very nice study in March 2022. It was a 17-year-old male who had a nice response to N-acetylcysteine. The patient presented to clinic with hair loss, twisting of hair. The patient shaved the hair in an attempt to stop the twisting of hair. The patient was given cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, and the CBT helped the patient's underlying depression and anxiety, which is wonderful, but the CBT therapy did not help the touching and twisting and rubbing of the hair. And so as you read more into this study, you realize that the patient is not only twisting and pulling hair, but is rubbing the hair, rubbing the scalp. And that's not trichotillomania, that's trichoteromania. So trichoteromania is hair loss from rubbing of the scalp. And that's important because it's a cousin of trichotillomania, but it may have different um, brain behavioral mechanism. It may have different neurotransmitter mechanisms in the years to come. We don't understand fully what causes trichotillomania. Trichotillomania, of course, we don't understand fully what causes trichotillomania, but it's important to realize in this study that this 17-year-old had trichotillomania, or hair loss from rubbing, as well as trichotillomania. So the author started the patient on 600 milligrams twice daily of N-acetylcysteine, and then increased to 1,200 milligrams twice daily. The patient tolerated it well. After six months, had a decreased desire to twist the hair. Remember, I reviewed earlier, it takes a little while before N-acetylcysteine starts working. In fact, it takes about nine weeks. This is available free online with Creative Commons license. References are in the show notes, so pull up the study by Popova and Mancuso titled Dramatic Improvement of Trichotillomania with Six Months of Treatment with N-acetylcysteine. And you can see the dramatic improvement in the patient's hair. The patient went from having significant hair loss in the crown, being able to disguise much of the hair loss. This is a really nice report of N-acetylcysteine helping trichotillomania and trichotyromania. I really do like this study a whole lot. It would be nice for trichotyromania to appear in the title. It would be nice for it to appear in the abstract because I really would like it to be indexed in the future. So when researchers are looking to understand trichotillomania, when they're looking to understand trichotyromania, that they can really access this study and otherwise it will be lost unless they dig it up in some other way. But this is a valuable study. It shows us that in this patient that benefited from cognitive behavioral therapy, depression improved, anxiety improved, you'd think if anxiety improves and depression improves, ah, trichotillomania should improve. Well, it didn't in this study. It didn't improve until N-acetylcysteine was given. We know placebo rates are huge in trichotillomania literature, 21%. So one might think that maybe this is placebo. It could be. We don't know. But 
delay in improvement would suggest that maybe it's a real effect. The prior studies by Block and colleagues suggest that N-acetylcysteine doesn't work in children. That randomized study had children and adolescents, including those up to 17 years of age, but not a lot of 17-year-olds. And so we have to keep in mind that there's a spectrum from children to adolescents to adults. And if N-acetylcysteine helps adults, clearly there's going to be a teenager that it's going to benefit in. And maybe this is the teenager. And so we have to be careful in saying that N-acetylcysteine doesn't help our pediatric patients, because it very well may, especially a 17-year-old. And so that's it for this week. We've reviewed the use of N-acetylcysteine in trichotillomania. We've looked at traction alopecia and the use of oral minoxidil in traction alopecia. And we've looked at several studies of telogen effluvium. We've looked at the use of SSRIs in telogen effluvium and the fact that most SSRIs are pretty similar in their ability to cause telogen effluvium but SSRIs are probably less likely to cause telogen effluvium than bupropion. Overall, about 1 in 100 patients on SSRIs have hair loss. We looked at iron supplementation and the good safety of IV iron, and 1 in 17,000 infusions having a serious reaction requiring epinephrine. We looked at the use of every other day iron dosing and the fact that Giving iron every other day in women with iron deficiency anemia, premenopausal women, is probably just as good at giving it every day. And so that's really important data and improves compliance. And we looked at a new mechanism of hair loss from COVID-19, a dystrophic antigen effluvium. And so now we not only have telogen effluvium, but we have antigen effluvium on the list of mechanisms of hair loss in COVID-19. I think that's a really nice study. We looked at two papers with dystrophic antigen effluvium as a mechanism. And so that's it for this week. I want to thank you very much for joining me again this week. If you'd like to connect with our office at any time to share your thoughts, please do so. We're at info at donovanhairacademy.com and I want to thank everyone for their many emails and suggestions and comments. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Next week, we're back. We're back next Monday. And we're back for the third Monday of the month, and that's dedicated to scarring alopecia and a number of very interesting studies in the area of scarring alopecia that have been published in the last month or two. And I'll look forward to welcoming you back here on Evidence-Based Hair.